for getting online. Welcome everyone. As you're uh, getting online here, if you don't mind, uh, just throw your uh, name, your title, and your district in the chat. Just so everybody knows where everybody's at, who they are, what they do. And we will get started in just a moment or two here. I'll introduce myself while we're waiting. My name is John Graham. I'm the elementary digital learning specialist at the main DOE, and I get to uh, play substitute teacher for the first time in a long time, subbing for Emma Marie Banks today. So if anybody has um, questions that come up, um, certainly feel free to add them in the chat. I will try to answer them as best that I can, but I will certainly capture any that I cannot and we'll pass them along to Emma who got double booked or like triple booked during a uh, computer science education week so and of course this will be recorded so if people need to bow out or they miss something or someone else in your district wants to access the recording um, it'll be saved and it will go live on the mobile lab site that we have set up and I'll share that link in just a minute in the chat. And then okay. I can turn it over to Brad and Lindsay from Sphero. Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Fessler. I am the professional development and content manager at Sphero. Uh, just to give you a little bit about my background, I spent 15 years in grades 9 through 12, uh, technology and engineering education, and five years in higher ed um, as an adjunct professor uh, teaching CAD and engineering concepts. So if you have a question throughout this, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, I'll do my best to kind of go through that chat at the end of the session and answer everything I can um, that's, that's uh, pertinent in there. Um, so with that being said, if you didn't introduce yourself yet, please do so um, in the chat, your name, your title, the district that you work in, um, in the chat, please. With that being said, I'd like to introduce Lindsay. And if you don't mind, Lindsay, give a, just a brief overview of what you do. Sure. Um, my name is Lindsay DeLong. I am the Education Partnership Manager for the Northeast, so for Maine. And I, um, my position really is to work with um, the DOE as well as all of the districts and schools in your state to support you in your really in your process. So everything from product knowledge, product questions, if you have anything that you want to know more about in terms of um, our products, our curriculum, um, professional development, uh, maybe in the future for, for your individual school or district, if you have questions about or Ordering, whether you've already purchased your um, labs, which most of you have, um, but if you have any questions about that or haven't purchased yet, um, you, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm your essentially your point person for anything. Um, and if I'm not sure what the answer is, I will get it for you. Um, I'm. Not, do you have uh, Brad? Do you have my contact info on a slide or no? I can't hear you. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're Sorry, do you mind uh, just throwing that in the chat? Please? Yeah, I will. I will. And actually, I can. Um, I believe that you are. I'm not sure if you're putting your contact info in here, but um, I'll, uh, we can share it too afterwards. Yeah, but I'm, gonna, I'm I'm putting it in the chat right now. Um, yeah, I will put mine in there as well. All right. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate it. All right. I'm going to spotlight myself here so you, everybody can see my screen when I share here. 
And let me organize here one second. Okay. So today we're going to talk a little bit about Sphero Indie, right? So hopefully everyone has an Indie kit in front of you um, and has one charged because uh, unlike a lot of other webinars where we just kind of listen, uh, we're going to be somewhat interactive active today and get to play around with this robot, learn a little bit about it. Um, so I will kindly ask for everyone's participation as you go through here. Um, you know, feel free to interject um, with some questions and things in the chat, and then I'll gladly answer those at the end of the session. All right. So overview of what Andy is. So um, Indy is this cool little robot. If you don't have one in front of you, this is Indy. Um, Indy is a four wheel robot with a cool little color sensor on the bottom, has some headlights up here that can change colors and the Spiro logo up here that changes colors as well as we have that speaker in there to play some sounds. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how that works, what that is. Uh, we're going to talk about computational thinking um, in basically the primary grades. We're going to take a look at two different challenge cards and actually do those interactive um, throughout this, this training. And we'll talk about two other uh, activities that are out there that we like to do with Indy that are a whole lot of fun, how to reset your kit, and then what is next after this? All right, so uh, one of our mottos with Spiro is we want to transform the way students learn, whether it's in the classroom, in the living room, um, however that is, wherever they're at, STEM centers, we try to support as many people as we can because we want students to learn coding, STEAM related things and do it in a very fun, way. So that is what we do, right? Um, we are also change makers. So uh, we want people to think critically. We want them to collaborate. We want them to be able to communicate. That's a very important part of this. You can be the greatest coder ever, but if you can't communicate what you're doing, that's a problem. So that's very important. We want our students to be really creative, and this is really fun thing to watch um, for us as educators to watch students uh, really take these robots and do things with them we would have never thought of um, as the educator. So it's really a lot of fun to see that creativity. We want students to be curious. How um, can they work with this thing? What can it do? How can I make it do things that maybe no one else has made it do before? So we want them to work through there. And uh, this is a very important piece. And hopefully uh, by introducing all of us today in that chat, you're hoping you're starting to build a community, right? You want everyone to be able to work together, share ideas with each other. Um, nothing's more rewarding for me that when we're at a conference, have somebody walk up to me and be like, hey, did you ever see anybody do an activity like this and share their idea with me? I love that because that just shows that if you own a Spiro, you're part of the Spiro community. Um, so we want uh, our students to be part of that as well as our educators. All right. So play, that word play, sometimes it's really looked down on in the classroom, like, oh, you're just playing around, you're not learning anything. But that is really a, a really tough misconception there. So we want our students to um, utilize that creativity and curiosity and play with the robot to learn about it, because you can learn a great deal uh, about something by playing with it. So we're going to take about 10 minutes. Um, normally, if we were doing this in person, I'd say find a partner since we're all virtually and we're kind of spread out around. Um, if you don't have anybody that's right there next to you, uh, work on this yourself. But grab an indie student kit. Uh, feel free. You can decorate your indie if you want and hold it up to the camera later. Um, I want you to explore and tinker and play around with it. You do not need a programming device 
for this. I want you to figure out everything you can about Indy in the next 10 minutes. Does anyone have any questions about what they need to do the next 10 minutes? All right, make it happen. I'm gonna start a timer and get us going.
We have about five minutes left to explore our indie. Uh, feel free to take notes. I'm going to ask for so, a couple volunteers at the end of our time here to uh, tell us what they learned. All right, one minute warning, wrap up what you're doing there to figure out Indy and we'll bring it back together here in about 50 seconds.
All right. So uh, if you don't mind uh, coming back on and share what you might have learned, if, feel free to unmute and just give us a brief explanation of what you learned. Everybody's scared. We didn't learn anything. We um, took a coffee break. <laughs> I'll, I'll say something. Um, okay. Cheryl Roberts prior, um, different colors um, do different, have different actions like fast, right, left, little celebration dance, things like that. I'm wondering, um, do you always have to start with green at the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, you do. You always have to start with green with one exception. If you reprogram Andy for different behaviors using the app. Oh, gotcha. But, but by default, yes, you always have to start with green. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Anybody else? May learn something different. What happens when you put Indy on a, a particular color? Did anyone notice that? It changes like to that color. Whatever that color yeah. is, it'll change to it. Yeah, exactly. So those that light, that, that Spiro logo on the top will change colors as well. So um, as you can see, sitting down and just playing around with something is a very powerful way to learn about it, right? Um, and it's important to recognize that some of our students don't learn uh, particularly well from that direct instruction and they need that hands-on time to explore something, right? So let's take a look at what each tile here does. Green is go or go faster. So after India is moving, if you go across a green tile again, Indy will go faster. There are limits to that. Indy has three speeds uh, moving. Um, so if you put like eight green tiles in a row, Indy is only going to, um, Indy will respond to it, but not go physically go faster after that third speed is reached. Then we have yellow, which will make Indy slow down. Again, the same concept with green. There's three speeds. Once you get down, um, to that bottom speed, Indy will still recognize the yellow tile. It just will not um, go any slower than that. All right. Uh, the red tile is stop for Indy. The purple tile is celebrate. Indy does this cool little dance. And uh, I had talked a little bit about the Spiro EDU app, and we will talk about it in more detail later. But you can configure what that looks like in the app, which is pretty cool. And then we have the pink tile, which is 90 degrees to the left, the blue tile, which is 90 degrees to the right, the orange tile, which is 45 degrees left, and the teal tile, which is 45 degrees right. Now, at first, when you start playing around with Indy, you're like, oh, that's a lot to remember. How do I remember which, which directions which? So here's how my brain rationalizes that, is if you look at blue and teal, right, in terms of art, they are cool colors, right, versus warm colors of the orange and pink. And um, it's always cool to be right. You know, you answer a question and you want to be right uh, when you answer that question. So that's how I remember it in my brain. It's always cool to be right. So the cool colors will send Indy to the right. All right. So Indy is designed uh, for our youngest learners here, um, our pre-K through second grade. And the cool thing is I've actually um, talked to educators who actually use this at a high school level even to talk about more advanced concepts like statistics and things like that. Um, you know, the science end of things and digging deeper into it. So we say it's pre-K through second grade, but the reality is um, put all of that in there, um, you know, throughout those grade levels. It's about creativity of utilizing this. It can be a screenless 
learning environment, which is really super important. Um, you know, so many, uh, I'll even say just people in general are addicted to that screen in front of them, right? In some way, shape or form. And they have to have that in front of them and getting them away from it and giving meaningful learning experiences, I think is super valuable. So Indy is amazing at, at being able to do that. You don't need that screen in front of you um, all the time. Uh, Indy has an onboard color sensor, which is on the bottom. That's the little device that's actually reading the color of the tile. And it's a very engaging product. Here is what we call in the drafting world an exploded view. Um, don't worry, no Indies were harmed in the making of this slide, right? Um, it's just drafting files of it pulled apart so you can see the internal workings of Indy. And something to note here is these little gear boxes that are on the back wheels that drive Indy. Um, us as adults, when we see something spinning like that, we don't grab the part that's spinning. I don't know, it's just something that we've learned over time is probably a bad idea. Students that haven't learned, all students haven't learned that at these levels, right? So they're just gonna grab Indy, right? And if you grab it by the wheels, you're gonna hear the, the sound that it makes and you're thinking, oh man, we're, they're destroying my robot, right? Don't worry, Indy has clutches in that gearbox and is designed to handle that. So if you hear that clicking, grinding sound that's going on in there, don't worry about it. It's okay, no one's hurting an Indy. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about them breaking that. So that's something really, really good to know um, when we go through there. Um, it has those two motors, so it's rear wheel drive. It has the LEDs for the headlights and the logo at the top. And um, we also have uh, the speaker, which I mentioned earlier. And there's actually two ways to charge Indy. On the back of Indy, there's a USB port uh, that you can actually plug into to charge it. Or on the bottom of Indy, you'll see there's two little um, copper contacts that are on the back there. Uh, behind the color sensor towards the back of Indy. And that is where, when you slide it into the little uh, yellow charging box to charge a bunch of them, you can charge it that way as well. So there's no need to manage eight USB cables in a class pack and plug eight of them into a wall. You can plug that one charging uh, cord into the wall, drop them all into the charging case and you're good to go. Just makes it really handy. Um, we like to support computational thinking. That's really important skills. And we're going to dive into that here uh, in just a moment. Um, but that's really, really important to teach our kids these skills. We want to inspire them um, to, to learn. We want to nurture that curiosity and problem solving as they go through there. And again, to reiterate, there is no app um, or device needed to be able to do these activities. So just a quick quote here, the goal um, is to use computational thinking to forge new ideas, to solve those problems, forge things as we go through and, and work on that. So when we're talking about computational thinking, we want to start with our youngest students. We wanna develop that muscle memory. The brain is a muscle, right? We wanna, um, we all know that as educators, um, when, when students come back from that summer break or that extended holiday break, whatever it might be, that they, they have, they, they've forgotten a bunch of things and we have to review a bunch of things and get them back in the groove of that, right? So we wanna exercise that as often as we possible, uh, possibly can. So when we talk about computational thinking, we have uh, four pillars here. We have decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, and algorithmic design. And each of these four pillars are used um, by our students, even if they don't uh, consciously recognize it. Um, we want them to be doing these things to solve problems. Right? So uh, decomposition, we're simplifying the problems into manageable parts. So uh, with that, 
I like to uh, talk about NASA. We finally got the Artemis rocket off the ground, right? The Artemis mission. Um, it took many tries, but they got it off the ground and it's happening. So if I said to a group of what we have uh, 18 people or, or so here today, um, if, if I said to all 18 of us, hey, we're gonna launch a rocket to the moon. You're going, yeah, Brad, okay. That's probably not gonna happen, right? But if I said, all right, group, we're going to figure out what that uh, one little thing looks like to get that rocket off the ground. What does, where does the armrest need to go so that the astronaut's comfortable during the rocket launch? The 18 of us can probably figure that out as a team and work together. So that's decomposition. We're taking that big problem, breaking it down. Then we want to look at the pattern recognition. And this is where we're identifying and analyzing all those trends and patterns that we see in the data um, to make that happen. Indy is innately amazing at this because you all recognize, hey, when I put Indy on green, Indy goes, that's a pattern, right? So Indy is amazing at, at getting students to develop that skill. Then we have abstraction. So this is where we can represent something complicated using uh, a very simple model. And we'll take a look at uh, a storytelling activity um, and other activities uh, throughout this session that kind of bring that out as we go. And then we have algorithmic design. And this is where people go, well, well this is computational thinking is just for programmers. And it's not, it's for everyday use, right? You have all used computational thinking skills just today, right? Um, just to get up, get dressed, right? Get to work. You've done all of these things, right? You've done all of these pillars, all of these steps to get there. You've solved that problem of, hey, I got to go to work using that logical sequence um, as you went. So we're going to watch this, uh, just a real quick video here of... Uh, about computational thinking. Brad, I'm not sure if you can see our chat, but there, we can't hear any sound. Okay, sorry. Let me see what's going on there. You should be able to hear that coming through. Let me try that again. Computational thinking. What is it? And why is it so important? Let's start by looking at the what. You may think that computational thinking is about thinking like a robot or programming like an expert, but it's not. Rather, it is a very versatile skill, a skill that focuses on critical and logical thinking. To put it simply, computational thinking is a problem solving skill. Let's dive a little deeper. Computational thinking is about looking at a problem and solving it systematically, and therefore arriving at a solution that both humans and computers can understand. Essentially, it is considered the highest order of problem solving. Computational thinking is made up of four elements, decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, 
algorithmic thinking. First of all, decomposition. Decomposition is about breaking a difficult problem down into simple and easy to manage parts. Second, pattern recognition. Problems come in all shapes and sizes, but amongst their many differences, there are bound to be similarities. Pattern recognition is about spotting what different problems have in common and using what's worked before to help you out again. Third, abstraction. Abstraction is all about focusing on the details that matter while ignoring the ones that don't. By applying abstraction, we can cut through fluff to get to the heart of the matter. Finally, algorithmic thinking. Algorithm is really just a big word for a set of rules. So algorithmic thinking is basically when you generate a series of simple steps that anyone can follow to solve a problem. Now, let's bring everyone together with a simple example. Meet Max. He's your average hardworking young man, trying his best to be a productive member of society. But today, Max's car has broken down. Luckily enough, he's computational thinking enabled. Let's see how he solves this problem. Max's car can't move too well. He realizes that there are two problems. He's running low on fuel and he has a flat tire. That's the first pillar, decomposition. Now Max has been in a similar situation before and based on past experience, he knows that he should take care of the flat tire first. That's the second pillar, pattern recognition. He doesn't have much fuel left, but it's enough to get him to the next patrol station. So he decides to ignore that and focus on the tire. That's the third pillar, abstraction. Finally, to change a tire, Max has to use a jack to elevate his car, loosen the nuts on his tire, remove the tire, and replace it with a new one. Now that's algorithmic thinking. As you can see, computational thinking isn't just for computer scientists or programmers. In fact, many kinds of people, from mechanics, doctors, to presidents, are subconsciously applying computational thinking in their daily lives. Thanks, Max. Have a nice day at work. So why is computational thinking so important? It's not. That is, if you don't mind being left behind in the Stone Age. According to Moore's law, computing performance doubles every 18 months. That is to say, in 10 years, a $1,000 computer will be able to compute faster, more efficiently than the human brain. With technology growing at such an exponential rate, we are integrating computers more than ever before into our lives to connect, to optimize solutions, and most importantly, to solve problems. The possibilities are limitless. The problem is having a supercomputer carry out basic instructions and tasks is not at all economical. To make full use of a supercomputer, you'd need to know how to give super instructions. This is where computational thinking comes in, a powerful way to generate advanced solutions and manipulate computers to work for you. Now, imagine if mankind had such immense power at our fingertips. We would be solving problems faster than ever before with laser accuracy and machine efficiency. With computational thinking and supercomputers, the dream to tackling titanic problems such as finding a cure for cancer can be a reality, pushing mankind beyond the final frontier and boldly go where no man has ever been before. All right, so hopefully we got a good understanding of what computational thinking is and how it works, um, because this is what we're trying to work with our students to develop those skills. All right, with that being said, it's time for us to practice our skills uh, on our own here. So we are going to do ND challenge card number 12. And if you don't have your cards open yet, it's okay. I'm gonna put it up here on the screen for you to work with. But uh, as we go through here, this is what our challenge card looks like. And I want you to solve those um, spaces that are there. So if you have your kit, go ahead, get your indie out, get your tiles out. Uh, you'll probably want to work on the floor, um, which is where your students are, unless you happen to have a really large table in front of you to work with. But actually solve this challenge, get Indy to run that. If you don't have a kit in front of you, um, think about what those tiles are. And if you go into uh, the Sphero website, you can actually um, go through 
and look at uh, the teacher resources and find some of that information if you don't have a kit in front of you. All right, so let's take uh, just a brief couple of minutes here because we gotta keep moving and see if we can solve this challenge card. Are, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, are the challenge cards different because my 12 is not the same as that one? Yeah, it could. It is possible. It depends if you, which kit, um, which form of the kit you have. So uh, I probably have the older cards versus you have the newer ones. Um, and, so you're, you're, you'll have this card, it just will be a different number. And my, the, and do ours have, they don't have numbers on them. So we're not like, we have to figure out where. Oh, you mean the, the arrows don't, or the question marks don't have numbers? Right. Yes, correct. They will not. They will not. So but we you don't... have the arrow. You have the, the, the arrow will be on that card. Yeah. Um, so you can see like in this example, you start at green and you're moving this direction. From there, that'll be on you to kind of figure that out. Um, as you go through there. And that's part of the problem solving we want our students to do. Okay, but, and my one and two don't have any blanks or question marks or? Correct, because they all kind of build upon each other, right? So one and two are, hey, just get Indy to move, right? So get it started on green, get it to stop on red, um, um, get it to start on green, get it to celebrate on purple, um, speed up, slow down. Like you're learning the very, very basic. Of the okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Great questions. So this is what it would look like kind of laid out on your floor if you're building this, right? You obviously don't have the question marks. I put them there to challenge you because I'm not quite ready to give you the answer just yet. I will in just a moment, but this is what we are trying to solve. Notice how not everything is perfectly aligned and things like that. These are all things that students will do, right? So making sure that Indy hits all of the tiles is an important factor here. Um, when you aim it, Indy will travel in the direction um, that it is set in on the green tile. So if you set Indy at an angle, Indy is gonna travel at that angle. So it's important to aim the robot the direction you want to go when you set it down. All right, so let's take a look at what Indy looks like when Indy does this. So I'm going to take my Indy here. I'm going to turn Indy on. Notice Indy lights up, ready to go. And I'm going to set Indy on my green tile. Okay, so you can see I didn't have it aimed perfectly. So what happens is Indy ran off those tiles, right? So that's important to know that you might have to make some adjustments. When you speed Indy up, things can get difficult for aiming. So for instance, when we look at this particular challenge, right after a green tile or that question mark that I labeled number one, is there a different tile that I can put there? Anybody have any suggestions? Yellow. 
Yeah, I can put yellow in there, right? If I put yellow in there instead of uh, green, Indy would slow down. So I can actually take these two and swap them if I wanted to. And I'm still solving that same challenge. So Indy's much more slower and controlled now. And I think I'm going to be off this a little bit. Oh, I hate it. Right? And um, when you do this with students, at this point, uh, while Indy's dancing around, they're going to be jumping around and, and, and celebrating as well, right? Um, just the same way Indy does. It's a whole lot of fun to work with students with this thing. Okay? So that's a challenge card. Here's another challenge card that's in there. Um, again, this might be a different number depending on your particular um, set. And I, I like to use this one with adults because I think this one is uh, pretty, pretty challenging for adults because you are running over the same tile more than once when you do this. And for the sake of time, because we have a lot to do here, I'll walk you through this particular challenge, right? So as we're going, if you look at this tile, and I know it's hard to see the grid lines, but remember that Indy can only move in 45 degree angles or 90 degree angles. So when we get to here, if I go 45 degrees left, I never hit one another one of those question mark tiles, right? Or any other tile. And if I go 45 degrees right, I don't either. So that will um be something that you have to like you know consciously think about with students they're like well i could go to this one not really because that's not an angle that's possible with the default setup so the only place you can go from here is to the pink right so what tile would this need to be let's see if anyone remembered my my saying Blue? Yeah, be blue, right? Because blue is the cool color. It's cool to be right. We're going to turn 90 degrees to the right. So this question mark would have to be blue. And as much fun as it is to give all the answers, I can't give them all to you, right? You have to explore a little bit. So, um, you know, as you have some time, play around with this challenge card because this one I think uh, is a whole lot of fun and it will put your skills to the test. Once you've done this, I think you probably mastered. Uh, being able to work with Indy in using those challenge cards, right, as you go through. All right, so let's talk about storytelling with Indy, because this is a whole lot of fun. Um, and this also shows that Indy is not just, we're teaching computational thinking, and it's not something you add into your curriculum. And that's something that so many teachers, including myself when I was in the classroom, um, when something new was introduced to me, I'd be like, and when am I supposed to do this? Like how, like, <laughs> I have all these other things I need to cover, right? When am I possibly going to add, find more time to do this? Don't think of this this way. This is how you teach something that you're already teaching in your classroom. It's not in addition to, right? So with storytelling, you're going to come up with your favorite story or if you're working um, with some of the older students and they're at a point where they can write their own story, have them write their own story. And then you're gonna transform your indie into the main character. And if you have multiple indies in the classroom that are available, you can even use a second indie if you have multiple characters to do this. And then you're gonna take a section of that story and then um, program indie to tell that story. So. Some things you might think about when you're doing this is Indy's your character, you have a set, right? So arts and crafts time, let's build this set. Um, so Indy's going tile to tile, right? Into these different sets. You're telling that story as you go, right? A very popular one to do is Three Little Pigs. You can have Indy crash through, uh, you know, the straw house, right? And use like drinking straws to go through it and, and do all kinds of things. Um, 
things like that. Um, it's a whole lot of fun that way. Um, if you want to make it uh, a more extensive challenge, a cool way to do that is tell students that they have to reuse at least one tile. So Indy drives in, in somewhat of a loop to repeat tiles, right? And tell them a minimum number of of tiles that they have to use so that they're not going just in a straight line, force them to use turns and things like that as they go through this. Uh, I'll give you a real quick example that we did in a training one time. Uh, someone wanted to use Indy to teach uh, the life cycle of a butterfly, right? So Indy was uh, decorated as a caterpillar. It went through this tunnel, which looked like a cocoon. And then when it came out, there was a like, we used like pipe cleaners uh, bent so that it looks like uh, a butterfly. And Indy grabbed the pipe cleaners on the way out of the, the tunnel, out of the cocoon. And Indy's now the butterfly, right? Um, so you can do some really cool things beyond the ELA skills here. You can bring the science part of things in here as well. In a class pack, you'll also find uh, the Indie uh, Educator Guide. And if you can't find it, this took me a couple minutes to find it in my class pack. When you lift the lid up, there's a zipper inside the lid. Unzip that and it's stuffed inside of there, right? So if you can't find it, it's inside of there. Um, you know, grab that. There's all kinds of ideas beyond just those challenge cards of activities that you can do. Um, as you go through here, uh, eventually even going into the Spiro uh, EDU Junior app. So yet another resource for some cool activities. And then the last part of this is the EDU Junior app. And this app allows us to configure what our indie does, right? So the cool part is you can change what the tile makes indie do. So remember I said green is always the start unless you go in and make a change, which is really pretty cool um, to go through and do this. This is not where I would start. This is more of the advanced kind of uh, programming that your students are going to do um, through this. So just to give you an idea what this looks like, here I have my app. I've turned Indie on. I'm just going to tap on the app here, and it's going to look for my device. It's going to scan. You'll hear my Indie made a noise there, and I'm now connected to my Indie. So from here, across the top, we have all the colors of our tiles, right? So we have green, we have our yellow, we have our red, we have our purple, right? So you can configure what each of these does. So at purple, then, we have movements, we have lights, and we have sounds. So we can change all of these things. So remember, Indy does this particular celebration here. Maybe I want it to do something else. Maybe I want it to do uh, the party dance here. And I can just drag and drop this into here. And Indy is now reprogrammed for that. So. I don't have to do anything else. I just changed what Indy does. If I want to change um, what Indy plays music wise, say I want Indy to play happy birthday when that happens, I can do that, right? And if I want Indy to change colors, not that particular shade of purple, maybe I want Indy to um, you know, fade through colors there. I can do that. So just by dragging and dropping those blocks, I now reprogram my indie. So just so we can see what happens, I'm going to do a very basic green to purple here. It was probably hard to hear that because it's across my room. Um, but Indy kind of, you saw Indy dance back and forth. It did a different um, thing there. Super easy to do. And if you want Indy to uh, do something different, um, you can just go back in and make changes right inside of the app for all of those things. Now, 
The next question is, how do I get Indie back to the default? Well, yes, you can go into the app and do all of that, blah, 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 right? And no problem. But on the back of the button, or where the power button is, if you press and hold that power button, you'll see Indie will blink, make a noise, and then turn off. Indie is right back to its default state. So all of those changes you just made are reset back. So it makes it really easy to put that all back together, right? Um, we're going to skip through this because of time. Resetting your kit. This is the number of tiles that are in there. This is probably a great thing if you have your phone in front of you, take a picture of your screen right now, um, just so you have it. Uh, if you your students mix kits together to do multiple things at one time, this is how how you want to reset your kit. All right, we have about a minute. So quick questions. I think Lindsay's been doing a great job facilitating questions and answering as we went. Right, so there's there's your indie cards. Sorry, go ahead. That picture. All right, no other questions? I know some of you are gonna be in Bolt, so we'll see you all in just a moment. If you're going there, if not, have a great evening. Thank you, everybody.